Well, hello there. It is Tomster here on behalf of Indestructible Productions once again. And continuing on with the extremely heavy neck that I made for the scum, uh, we're going to be looking into what went on in the making of the neck. Um, this is going to be a bit of a longer video, so let me know if you actually prefer um, the roundabout 10 minutes or so, a little bit less, or whether you would like these videos to be well, more like this, closer to 20 minutes, maybe even half an hour. We'll see. The most annoying thing about this is that I need to remember not to go on way too many tan tangents because um, 20 minutes is a lot of time to fill with a lot of pointless things, just like I've wasted this entire intro now. Um, but yeah, that was fairly straightforward. All I did was unclamp everything. And now I'm just making sure that the center lines do still meet up because that is extremely important. Everything looked good. So now it's time to rough cut the profile for the neck. Um, yes, this is way, way too big of a chunk um, than you actually would need for this sort of thing. But I did decide to make two necks out of this. Um, the other neck, well, you'll see what the other neck goes into later on. Um, yeah, anywho, uh, fairly straightforward. I marked down the side of this entire piece of wood exactly where I want my neck to be. I made basically a one-to-one -one drawing of the side profile of the neck, volute and you know, um, headstock angle and basically the thickness of the neck. Uh, fairly easy line to follow. I'm not going to go straight on that line, so to speak. I'm going to leave a little bit of extra just so I have some room to work with. And then, of course, because it is a neck through, I also marked out where the body is. It's fairly fa straightforward to do this. I This is one of the reasons why I really like making neck through instruments, because you have the side profile there already. You don't need to technically draw it onto a separate piece of paper, because you can draw it straight onto your neck. It's easy that way. Sure, there's plenty of things that are a lot more difficult, but I don't know. I, I do like making neck throughs. There's certain things that I would have done differently about this build as well, but you know, we're, you're always learning. There's always new things that you learn. Um, I'm sure if I did this now, I would say in another video that I would do things completely differently. So, yeah, it's just one of those things. I'm very hard to please. I, I am. Um, I'm very critical of my own work. But not to say that the scum didn't work out because it did turn out to be a very pretty guitar, and a very gorgeous feeling one too. I. Gorgeous feeling. I wonder if you can say gorgeous feeling. I don't know. Debate in the in the comments, I guess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, it did turn out very, very well, and I'm very proud of it. Now, once again, um, marking out. Oh, not not marking out the center line. This time, I'm marking out the width of the neck or the width of the fretboard where I want it to go. I know that the nut is going to be 43 mil, and at the uh, other end it's going to be 56 millimeters. So to rough that out, I am going to use the bandsaw once again. A very easy way of doing this as well is I'm, to be very honest, I'm kind of reminded of how I did things as I'm watching this, so I don't remember what I do next. Um, speed up the video clearly but um, Yeah, a very easy way of going about this is just removing some extra excess wood and then going back on the router table and using Basically a straight template of some sort to route out What you want I could have done that here Looks like I didn't uh, That would also make this part extremely easy because there's that little lip where the neck connects with the body that I now need to get rid of. 
If I would have routed that, I would have been able to get rid of that during the routing process. But like I said, always learning. So how I'm going about this is, is basically just sawing off the last, well, what I first did, I used a ruler and a scalpel blade to score the line. So I have somewhere to follow up with this nice PAX saw. The only thing about this pack saw, if I remember correctly, this might be the dull one that I'm using at first. It certainly looks that way. Well, I'll get there eventually. So, basically, I'm just cutting down to the body, uh, getting rid of all the excess wood. Once I've done that, clearly, um, I cut some of that off because uh, you don't want to watch me do that forever and ever. Then going back with a leveling beam and sanding everything nice and flush so I get a nice square side of the prep board, which is kind of essential for these sort of things. And the same thing repeated on the other side. It's very easy at this point already just to use 120 grit because you are technically removing quite a bit of wood. You don't need to go too fine just yet. All you need to do is get everything nice and flat. And this is exactly what works. Um, then using a file to kind of finesse that edge a little bit more. Um, you can also use a plane to do this. I think I use a rebate plane at first to get rid of the biggest portions and then I moved on to the leveling block <coughs> or leveling beam sorry leveling beam words are hard today for some reason now I need to what am I doing all right so I'm marking out where my strings would go so that I can actually draw on the headstock. So there I marked off the end, both ends of the nut, so both ends of the 43 mil nut, and then three and a half meter meet, three and a half millimeters in from both edges. So that's where my low E and my high E will sit. And then I use basically that little tool there that you saw. That is a um, God, um, what's it called? Not slotting um, ruler, I guess. It, it basically has, in different increments, according to the gauges of strings, different increments at which I'm not making any sense. It just shows you where the lines or where your strings should be, where your knot slots will be in correlation to the size of your knot. There we go, got that out. Um, and then I just draw straight lines. So those are technically where my strings will sit. Actually, that is pretty much exactly where my strings will sit. And that way it's very easy for me to figure out where I want to place my tuners. I am aiming to get straight string pull. For all of this, very important. Uh, and I am doing a reverse headstock. There's a couple of different reasons why I'm doing this. First off, I know that this guitar will be in somewhat of a lower tuning. So getting that extra bit of tension that is needed on the lower string will be that much more beneficial. And in general, so-called reversed headstocks just makes sense to me. It's a bit more ergonomic, at least for me, that when you're playing, going straight from the playing position, not having to turn over your hand onto the top of the headstock. Instead, you can keep your fretting hand in the same position that it would usually be in, and then just move it to tune whatever string you need to tune. It just makes sense to me. Um, now, throughout this entire build process, I am constantly taking pictures and constantly talking to the client at hand, because this guitar is very much like, the way that I described the scum to a lot of people is that it is 
pretty much the guitar equivalent of a tailored suit. It is exactly to my client's wishes. It fits him perfectly, but it is not a guitar that is definitely made for everyone. Um, it is very unconventional in many different ways, even from wood choices all the way down to neck shape and stuff like that. So I was being very particular in clearing up any sort of questions that I would have, even if they were small things, but I wanted to make sure that I built exactly the guitar that the client wanted. Now, there were some comments saying that it would be nice to hear um, why I'm using the woods that I'm using. And basically, I'm using maple because it is, without a doubt, a very good neck wood. But the thing that makes this one interesting is the fact that it's maple and beech. Now, beech is not usually used in guitar building, but once again, it was one of those things that the client always found very fascinating, using beech in a guitar. We had done it in the past with him before. Um, if you're familiar with the Rath guitar, the client was also a part of making that and designing it, so that used a beech neck and it turned out very nice. So why not try it again? See what else we can do with it. Um, quite clearly, there's nothing really else to it. And then when it came to the fretboard, uh, just wanted something a little bit more out of the ordinary. And nothing that no rosewood, no ebony, just because it is quote unquote boring or a little boring. So seeing as Sam bought a bunch of Bibinga and I bought some from him, thought, hey, why not use Bibinga? It's gorgeous, it looks pretty, so why not? And uh, yeah, that's what that ended up as. At this point in building the neck, we were still trying to figure out what wood to use for the body, but there was still plenty of time to do that. And we'll get into that once I actually start building the body, so. Anywho, uh, what you missed there, I basically just rough cut the shape of the headstock on the bandsaw. It's fairly straightforward. That's also a phrase that I say quite a bit. Now, um, this was also at the point where our spindle sanders, or bobbin sanders, were not really working all that well. So I had to substitute by using a pillar drill with a spindle attached to it. It does the same job, it's just spinning in the opposite direction to what I'm used to. So it was a little bit awkward, but it did the same job. This just basically cleans up all the bandsaw marks and gets me closer to the line that I've drawn. So I'm taking very little of that time, making sure that everything stays even. Now, once again, because um, I have to stop saying once again, it's annoying me now. But because our spindle sanders and bobbin sanders were broken, I had to figure out a way to get into the smaller areas. So, easy enough. Tom actually suggested this little trick of taking just a normal normal drill driver and um, putting a spindle on it. Or putting several different spindles on it to do the same job. This does take up a little bit more time but it did do the trick. And this is definitely something that, like any hobby builder could do in their little shed if, um, if you don't, for example, have big machines or can't afford big machines. This is something that you can do and it will work. It just takes a little bit of time. So now begins, that was a very weird saying. Anyway, now begins one of my favorite stages of guitar building, carving the neck. I do like carving in every shape or form, and carving a neck is always satisfying. So at the very first, at the very first, so one of the very first things that I do is get a rough idea of the shape on both the nut end and then on the 12th fret. 
and this allows me to kind of get those as close to what they need to be before bridging the gap in between the two like so so for instance let's say that I want uh, the neck thickness at the nut to be about 20 mil and at the 12th fret I want it to be 23 mil then I'll just work my way down on both ends once I'm down to let's say a millimeter could even go less than that could even go half a mil let's say that I'm in that area then I can start bridging the gap in between the two so at first I used one of my very very nice rasps that I got from my grandfather and now I'm using the Shinto saw rasp because my saw rasp is horrendous and this one is absolutely gorgeous. It, it is a very, very useful tool for carving necks. It removes a lot, a lot of wood at once, but it does have a finer side as well, so you can do some fine work. The whole point here is not to, or what I'm doing here is just kind of trying to get the middle portion correct and then going forward and doing the rest of the carve there you can see how well that rasp really does remove all that wood wonderful and then my favorite tool the spoke shave and this spoke shape especially is one that I customized during my school years. Uh, back when I made a Windsor chair, I needed a spoke shape that had shorter handles and a curved bottom. <clears throat> Not curved from front to back, as most curved spoke shapes are, but curved from one side to the other. So a bit of a rounder shape. This means that there is a smaller point of contact as well. And I found it particularly easy at this stage of carving a neck because I can easily remove smaller areas. Remove smaller areas. Work on a much smaller blade. It somehow helps me at least. I do have plenty of different spoke shapes, but this is without a doubt one of my favorite ones. And I'm making sure that I'm keeping that movement constant and keeping that so called radius the same. The shape of the neck doesn't really change as I remove the material from it. Now, here's one thing that I'm gonna say you really, really should have support under the neck when you're doing this part. Um, I do remedy this later on. I don't know if I filmed that, but I do remedy it later on. Basically what I'm doing now is just rough sanding out the radius of the fretboard. Because if I don't have the fretboard at, because now it's, I'm guessing, 8 mil, maybe 8.5 mil. I need it to be down to 7 mil to get an accurate sized neck. So you can see from this angle as well that the neck isn't all that it should be. And um, as you can see, I paused the video because I didn't realize that we're coming to the end. Anywho, we're going to be picking up um, later on and seeing how this whole thing progresses. Um, that actually went by a lot quicker than I thought it would have. <laughs> Alright, hey, um, see all of you guys later. and. Um, Thank you for watching. Hit that like button, subscribe, and here, I'll show you the end screen now. Bye-bye.